Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Sito lo posi cara ba, sito lo posi. Kada kila ko sito lo kiti ara mo na sopo lo kiti. Hika yara mo na sopo lo kiti ara mo na sopo. Rika taya la to sopo lo kiti ara mo na sopo lo kiti. Rika lo posi kaya la ba kaya lo kiti sito. Rika lo posi kolo sopo lo kiti. Ricondo le che la vuoi si caia la cata, ricche le cose solo così cara cata, ricco le bahata e le che te le cose to. Let your voice begin to raise them as you're following the leading of the Holy Ghost, the atmosphere that's stirring up. Ricco se chi a le che te, for the Lord is about to do a creative work. He's about to do a creative work. For he's the creator. Ricco se a le che te. Let your voice follow what's happening in the spirit. Let your voice happen with the spirit. Let your voice follow what is going on in the spiritual realm. He shot the lekete. He shot the lekele. He kaya kaya te. He shot the lekete. La kalawa kaya lekete. Jesus, Jesus, the Lord. You pick up my presence. We're in the flow right now. We're in the flow. You don't have to work it up. You just gotta flow. Oh Jesus. Where 
when we begin to ask God, He begins to be creative. He begins to do more than just bless you. He begins to just do more than answer your prayer. He gives you a volume. He gives you a macho. Linko say, for it's a creative work. Linko sayete. Linko no le kete mahala. Isho no le kete what I want you to understand is that I'm no longer answering your prayers out of repetition, out of just what you ask, but I am now going to answer your prayers in a creative way where you ask not just for blessings, not just for needs, but when I begin to fulfill in the creative dimension, where I begin to impart, transform, transfigure beyond your imagination, beyond your comprehension, where I will do a creative work. I will do a creative work. I am going to impart unto you a creativity. I am going to impart into you a dimension that is creative, that is like no other, that extends that's just blessings, but it extends to the supernatural, where I begin to impart, where I begin to get creative. Receive me of the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive me the creative dimension. Receive me where God no longer just blesses you, but he adds creativity to the miracle. Where he adds creativity to the need. Where he adds creativity to the blessing. Lord, you are creative. You are a creator. Creating is what you do. You never stop creating. He's going to do more than just answer your needs, but he's going to attach a, a creativity to your prayer. He's going to attach a creativity to your prayer. When God begins to speak, don't expect just the mundane, just the same old. Expect creativity to follow what He says. He can say, He can die When God says you're going to receive a miracle, expect creativity. When God says you're going to get healed in your mind, expect creativity. Expect creativity, for He's the Creator. Let's go to Kasai. Jesus, we worship you, Lord, we worship you in this place, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah Jesus.
the King of Lord. Yes, yes. Lord Jesus. Be lifted up. Be lifted up. 
the everlasting goals. Be lifted up and the King of glory shall come in. Be lifted up for everlasting goals. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong.
I release his presence in your living rooms in Jesus' name. I release his presence upon your house. That your house might have peace. When the king of great king of king and prince of peace is the one whose will is followed in that house. His will is the one that is sought for, not the human will. Not human intellect or ingenuity. But the will of the Lord in everything we do. Lord, we endeavor to do that every Wednesday, especially God. Lord, as we pray every Wednesday, kingdom-centered prayers. As we've signed up, each and every one of us, Lord, for that one hour that is holy, sacred, oh God, that is used by your kingdom, oh Lord, to manifest your will on the earth. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be a part of that, Lord. Oh, Bless everyone, God. That's my part of it. In this church and beyond, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, praise you, O oh God. Praise you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. Tonight, as we've dedicated Wednesday nights to learn how to pray, as I often said, and I keep saying it, because it is important that we need to learn, we need to be proficient in how to pray. Yes. Praying relational prayers and kingdom-centered prayers. Sister Chica and I are going to talk and speak and teach and endeavor to follow the Holy Ghost tonight in Jesus' name. And we thank God for what He is doing through you, His people. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh God. Would you lift up your hands? Would you worship Him wherever you're at one more time? Would you prepare your soul for God to speak to you this evening? Amen. As we begin really to get to do the will of God on the earth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, there is a pattern that Jesus left with his disciples in teaching them how to pray. God is a God of order, and God is a God of patterns. God is a God of consistency. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Bible says. It is displayed, the pattern in his creation. You look at the mountains, you look at uh, the shores of the beach, the plants, the animals. They live uh, and they are clustered uh, usually in the same place. He is a God of patterns. Yes, he is. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1 to 2, and it came to pass that as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he stopped, when he ceased, when he got done praying, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Or teach us how to pray. Can you imagine with me tonight when these disciples were observing Jesus Christ pray. You and I have seen great men of God pray. 
You and I have been in great prayer meetings, in great moves of God. Could you imagine God manifested in human flesh, in human form, the humanity of Jesus Christ praying to the Spirit of God? It caught their attention. They did not ask to be taught how to perform miracles. They did not ask to be taught how to discern the seasons of the times. But when they saw God in flesh praying the humanity of God, or praying to the Spirit of God, don't be confused. There's only one God. His name is Jesus Christ. There's no fictitious triune God of the Trinity. That is a doctrine of devils. I bind that spirit. I come against that spirit and that doctrine in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bind it unapologetically. I don't do it out of hate, but I do it out of love because we need to make it to heaven and we need to be saved. Lord, I loose people out of that doctrine, God. I loose people out of that deception, oh Lord. You are the only God. There's only one that sits on the throne. In the humanity of Jesus, both human and divine, the humanity of Christ, the anointed one was communing with the spirit in prayer. It caught their attention. They said, Lord, or God, because they were one God, Jews. Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. And so Jesus began to teach the pattern of prayer. He began to teach a pattern. Amen. And you could read this in your own time in Luke chapter 11. In verse 2, he said unto them, when you pray, God said that his house will be called the house of prayer. Amen. We say we thank God for that. Amen. There's preaching, there's teaching that is in order. But every, but every, something that transcends that, it is prayer. Right. You can do without singing. Right. We've had services without preaching. Right. We've had services where we forgot to take the offering. Right. <laughs> Amen. But you cannot do without prayer. Amen. Because prayer moves the hand of heaven. Right. Prayer is the vehicle that Jesus chose yes. that could move his hand. And things begin to be happening. Miraculous things on the earth. Amen. And so God said, when you pray, not if you pray. If you're not praying, you probably will not make it in these times. In these last days, if you're praying the same way you've been praying, you're not going to make it. Because there are things that are going to happen that is going to try the church. It's going to come against the church. You're seeing that persecution happen now. And so if there's anything that you need to do tonight, uh, you have to make time to pray. I said you have to carve out time. I don't care if you lose sleep. I don't care if you lose a meal. You have to pray. Jesus said when you pray. If you can watch a movie, you can pray. You could surf the web for endless hours. You can pray. There is no excuse not to pray. So Jesus took it for granted when he said unto them, When you pray, say. Because prayer involves the mouth. I said prayer involves the tongue. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. I'm not going to be extensive tonight. But I want you to realize the pattern, amen, and the two types of prayer that we've been teaching over and over again because prayer teaching is repetition. First is the relational prayers. You want to have a relationship with God. You have to have a relationship with God to be saved. 
Jesus said in the last days, the people actually that did wonderful works in his name, uh, the people that cast out devils in his name, did, those were the people of the name. Uh, they were one God apostolic that know the name. But Jesus said, I don't know you. Right. So you have to have a relationship with God. Uh, and communication is the foundation of any relationship. And so in your relational prayers, you enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. When you enter the presence of the king, you worship him. You praise him. It is the first pattern. Hallelujah. You always offer a sacrifice of praise. And if there's anything that you need to repent of, you clear that up before you do anything else. That nothing stands between you and your God. God will forgive sin. He will not tolerate unrepented sin. Because we have the privilege of repentance. He said if we confess our sins, He is just and faithful to forgive us of all our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can confess your sin. Whether you have godly sorrow that worketh repentance, that is great. But as soon as you confess it, Jesus forgives it. You can beat yourself, yourself up over your sin. Right. And if you do it long enough, uh, it's rooted in pride. Right. Because you say, well, I could have done better. Right. I could have done this. I am so... I'm so dumb I did this. It's centered upon you. You and I will begin to realize the longer we live, we need a Savior. Wow. Yeah. And so you yeah. receive the forgiveness of God. Amen. And then you could cast your cares upon Him. Amen. I feel like there's some cares in the house tonight. Would you lift up your hands? And would you cast your cares? Hallelujah. However you know how. Would you begin to believe that God loves you? He said, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. There's nobody in this lifetime that will care as much as Jesus cares for you. And you are not designed to carry the cares of life. Why don't you begin to cast it unto the Lord until you feel a release in your spirit until you're no longer anxious you're no longer worried you're no longer shamed you're no longer condemned that is an indication that you've cast all your cares not some but all of your cares upon the Lord now these are patterns amen it depends on their prayer how much time you spend on any of these. Don't put five minutes, another five minutes of repentance, another five minutes of casting your cares. That's not prayer. That is a tradition that makes the Word of God of none effect. But there is a pattern, which is what we are teaching. After you cast your cares, you're no longer burdened by this life. You could fight. You could run your race. Amen. Nobody runs a race with the luggage. Amen. That they're pulling. You've never seen a marathon runner. A hundred meter dash. No, they, they push that aside. They, in fact, the swimmers begin to do everything they can that they become aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, I guess. Some of them even shave their eyebrows so there would be no friction in the water. If they would do that for a sport, how much more you and I for a crown that is not corruptible. Right. Hallelujah. So you put on the armor of God. You can study Ephesians chapter 6. The armor of God. Amen. You saw it on, on our, our slide with Wednesday night prayers. There's a shield of faith. And you have to have the truth that holds everything together. You're girded about with truth. The belt of truth, it holds everything together. Your feet ready and covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. You got the helmet of salvation. You got the sword of the spirit. You have to put that on. 
Lord, I put on the helmet of salvation, and when I pray, oh God, uh, my thoughts will not begin to wander, oh Lord. Uh, because God, you shield my thoughts, for most of my battles are in the mind, oh God. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I take up my shield of faith. I believe in you, oh Lord. Uh, I have a measure of faith, God, but I release uh, the gift of faith to be in operation in me right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I can't demonstrate all of them, but you have to put it on. It's not your armor, it's God's armor. And after you're done doing that, then you could find kingdom-centered prayers. You pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. This is where you begin to bind and loose things. This is where you travail in tongues. This is where you begin to do spiritual warfare in tongues and intercession. Amen. That you articulate sometimes in tongues and sometimes in English. Jesus gave the keys to the church through Peter. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be loosed in heaven. Paul said, I travail in you again until Christ be formed in you. He said, I travail in birth for you again until Christ be formed in you. So these are patterns, amen, that you and I need to practice these are necessary so you will know why you're praying. Yes. Most people don't pray because they don't know what they're doing. They think it's a waste of time. How many have been there? Mm -hmm. So you pray a little token, 5, 10, 15 minutes, you know, on a good day, maybe 30, as you're washing the dishes or you're doing something else. Hello? That's not real prayer. That's not real communication. And so, when you are armed with knowledge that what you're doing has a pattern and it works, and it's taught by Jesus Christ, you begin to be convinced that your prayers are not wasted. Because your prayers don't have an expiration. It is stored in a golden vial in the book of Revelation. It is poured out at the right time by God himself. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 to 15, Paul said, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit is praying, but my understanding, I can't understand what I'm saying in tongues. Most of the time. Sometimes you can. If God allows you, sometimes you don't. So, so realize when you're praying in tongues, uh, you're not wasting your time. But you're Spirit is praying. Hallelujah. What is it then? Verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit. And I will pray with understanding also. There are times if God gives you a word in English to express, you speak it. You understand it. If it is His word. Hello? If it's your word, you're better off praying in tongues. If it's your, by this time in kingdom prayers, you're not casting your cares anymore. Right. When you're casting your cares, you can speak in English. Amen. Or tongues, or a mixture of both. But, but when you begin to pray in kingdom prayers, and you're doing warfare, it is God uh, that fights through you. It's, no, no, it's not your battle, it is the Lord's. Right, right. Hallelujah, you're merely a vessel that he flows through. It's his armor, not yours. You're merely a vessel, amen, that he begins to house with his spirit. Praise God. And so you pray with both. Understanding and in the spirit. Now, I don't know if you catch this, many people don't. I will sing with the spirit. You could sing in tongues. Amen. You ought to try that. It's the most wonderful thing. The most liberating thing. It's, it's just pure and peaceable. And I will sing with understanding as well. Hallelujah. So you pray in the spirit. You pray with understanding. You sing in the spirit. And you sing in English as well. 
Hallelujah. Would you lift up your hands right now when you ask God, Lord, let that knowledge of the word sink into my to my soul, not just my mind, God, my soul. I release, oh Lord, divine revelation upon your people right now of what prayer is all about, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why do we need to know? Because Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And when you don't understand what you're doing in prayer, you're not going to pray. But if you understand the pattern, and this is not extensive, and we'll keep on teaching it, you will pray because you realize, what, I'm, what am I doing right now? It's effective. It's fervent. And it avails much. So remember, as you pray, the adversary wants you to do your own will. He will use your flesh to do what you want to do, which is usually not to pray. Or to pray something that is not according to the will of God. Amen. Which is iniquity is doing your own thing. And in prayer especially, we can't be full of iniquity. We need to, to pray the will of God. Amen. And if you don't know what the will of God is, just talk in tongues. Because it's the Spirit of God praying through you. In Jesus' name. I want Sister Chica to come. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, God, that we will pray your will as vessels, O oh Lord. As vessels of honor, O oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ. That we will not waste any of our time, O oh God. But we will pray your will, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Jesus. Hallelujah. The title of my lesson tonight is Testing the Spirits. Testing the Spirits, identifying the three voices. Testing the Spirits, as we need to identify the three voices. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, yes. but try, try the spirit. Say that with me. Try, try the, the spirits. spirits, or test the spirits. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Tonight's lesson overlaps with other lessons that we have taught recently, and even with pastor's lesson tonight. And so I am hopeful that tonight's teaching will better equip you in your prayer journey. The Bible instructs us to try or test the spirits as we read that scripture, and there are three voices that we will always need to identify. And what are these three voices? The voice of God, our flesh or human will, and the enemy. These are the three voices that we always need to be able to identify. What are voices? When we talk about voices, we are referring to the thoughts and feelings or impressions that we sense or that come to our mind. Let's first talk about the voice of God. Do you remember the still, small voice? That is a primary way that God communicates through us in prayer that we need to learn to hear. Amen? I hope you're learning that now more that we're praying more, you need to know his still small voice. That's how he speaks to us. That is how the rhema operates. It is not audible, but it is a thought or impression from him that will always be consistent with his word or logos, right? The written word. And is usually supported or associated with his peace. 
The peace of God is a very significant feeling as it guards and protects our hearts and minds to remain in the realm of the spirit. It's what I call as our spiritual gauge that lets us know that an absence or a lack of peace is a spiritual signal that something is wrong or that something needs to be dealt with spiritually. Now, of the three voices, it's usually God's voice that should be the easiest to identify since it is associated with peace and we have the Word of God that can validate it. Of course, we need to know enough of the Word of God, right, by reading it and by rightly dividing the Word, studying it in its proper context, amen, so that we can be able to compare every thought that we receive in our mind with the principles that are in the Word of God. And that's what testing or trying the spirits mean, to first compare each voice with the Word of God so that after we validate that it's indeed God's voice, then we can obey it. And very important, if you're not sure if it's God's voice, do not act upon it. Even if you feel, open and close quotation marks, feel, it might be from God. It's important to get a clear confirmation and not to go by feeling because a lot of times our own will competes with God's will. Amen. Wherein we become so comfortable in our spirit to choose our own will without even verifying it. This is where it's vital to do what the scripture says, wait on the Lord. Give him time to confirm if it's indeed his voice. Remember, as my son said earlier, you know, God is not bound by time, amen? So we really can't even rush his will. His will will be done, amen, in his time. And for any major decisions that you need to make in your life, do seek for your pastor's counsel, since that is a biblical principle. Since your pastor and I, we also have a pastor and elders in our life that we consult with whenever we need to seek confirmation of God's voice and God's will. I just want to give you an example here. I remember when God answered Sister Terry's prayers for a miracle home. And when she got approved for funding, she started looking for her new home. She prayed for God's will and consulted with a pastor on God's specific direction for her. I remember that she wanted to live close to her family, um, which is understandable. And so she started applying for a home in that city, but that was not God's will. God had a bigger plan. He wanted to plant her in Rancho Santa Margarita, amen? So that there could be a witness for souls in that city. Amen. And Sister Terry followed the voice of God even if it did not seem the most convenient. And God confirmed his will and he is using her right now to be his witness in Rancho Santa Margarita. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So as you discern the voice of God, if it does not seem clear-cut or you can't find a confirmation in the Word of God, that it's best to either wait on the Lord to confirm it or seek the counsel of spiritual authority. And I hope you are seeking God's will in everything that you do. In matters of your work, your home, your family, 
your personal schedule, your trips, your finances, etc. Because that is his first commandment, right? To put God first in everything. Everything, above everything, and to love him what? What did he say? With all your heart, soul, mind, strength. You know, to me, that simply means everything. Right. Everything. God, we want to give you everything. All right, I'm going to move on to the second voice, or the voice of the, our flesh and human will. Flesh or human will. When the voice of the flesh speaks, it does not have the peace of God. But I would, I would describe it as a feeling of self-righteousness, which is kind of a subtle feeling there, you know. And with the voice of the flesh, it caters to the appetites of our flesh. Sorry, I couldn't fit that on the slide, but appetites of the flesh. And what are examples of that? It's all about comfort. It's all about convenience. And a big word here, pleasure, right? That's what the flesh wants. Comfort, pleasure, easy things, right? Easy things. And this voice also caters to our ego or pride right. that seeks personal dominance in stature, reputation, or value according to the world systems. What are the world systems like? Materialism, right? Vanity, performance, popularity. These are of the world, okay? Systems of the world. And that's what the flesh or the human will is after. Right. To have those things, amen? Now, you may think, oh, sister, we don't entertain the voice of our flesh because that is just so ungodly. We don't do that. But we've all done it quite a lot. Yep. Even with our Holy Ghost. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's the nature of our flesh. And you need to be very mindful of that in order to control what you say or what you do because most of the time, we just go with what we feel. Right. The voice of the flesh is all about me. Say me. Me. My opinion, my need, my plan, my right, my will, me. That's the flesh. You see, your flesh always wants to be in control. And the feeling of self-righteousness justifies that. And our problem is that we fail to wait on God. We fail to trust in God's methods to solve the situation. And so we feel that we need to solve by ourselves now and that is iniquity iniquity right. self will I, I have been guilty of it wherein instead of casting my care upon the Lord to receive his peace and to wait on him I have spoken things or, or done things because I felt I had to fix something or someone and it doesn't work that way. For that is catering to the voice of your flesh. And let me say this once again. If you are not sure if you're hearing God's voice, do not act upon it. The thought that comes in your mind. Right. Do not claim it. Do not really say, that's my thought. Right. You're not sure it, and you feel, oh, I need to say it. Do not, okay? And it also means do not speak it out. Remember the power of the tongue. Whatever you speak or confess, you bring it to life. Amen. Wow. Mm. Whatever you say. One thing that I have learned to do now more often is to keep 
my mouth shut. Wherein I make a choice not to share my thoughts if I don't feel the peace of God. Hey, my, my thoughts may sound very logical and justified, but if my spirit is not right, then it can cause a lot of damage. It may appease my ego. And that's why we do it a lot of times. Right. We want to justify ourselves. Remember the ego? We feel we need to speak it out because it's right. We feel it's true anyway. It's my right. It may appease my ego, but I've learned it's not worth the cost. It's not worth it. And my prayer is that you would let that be your new habit. To wait and make sure before you speak any thought. Because a lot of times, it's either your flesh speaking or the enemy. A lot of times. He's a prince of the air. We have this flesh and that is the nature of the flesh. So how do you win the battles over your flesh and over your human will? Cleanse your heart, repent of your sins, and forgive or hold no grudges in your heart. Like when you cleanse your heart, I know we say a lot repentance, but that also means making sure you're forgiven. That there's no, no, no grudges in your heart. Whenever after I repent of my sins, and repent of iniquity, I'll say, God, I choose to forgive. I forgive anybody who's hurt me. I, I choose not to hold any grudge. I, I forgive. I forgive. Okay, don't forget that because unforgiveness is one of the greatest barriers in our prayers, okay? So we need to choose to forgive all the time, all the time. So cleanse your heart, okay, to win the battle of the flesh. We don't want sin, amen, to be in our hearts. As, as Pastor um, taught earlier, Learn to cast all your cares unto the Lord on a daily basis. And he talked about that earlier. Number three, surrender your will completely to God on a daily basis. And this is the same as dying to your own will. Every day that you do that, die to your own will. Die to your will. Surrender it to God. I don't want to do my own will, Lord. You may want to do it, yeah. You feel it in your flesh, but it's like, I'm surrendering it to you. I'm surrendering it to you. Your will, God. Your will, not my will. Number four, fast so that you can crucify your flesh. Fast. Fasting crucifies your flesh by dealing with the strongest appetite of your flesh, which is... We all like to do eating, all right? Okay. Take note that one day of fasting every week is just for maintenance. And I encourage you to go on an extended fast as the Lord leads you to. As I've mentioned before, there will be bigger battles ahead. And you will need to be stronger in your spirit where you can't let your flesh weigh you down. The number five is walk in the spirit. As you deny your flesh, you must choose to follow the spirit. You can't just say no to the flesh and do nothing. You need to choose to walk in the spirit. When you give up an old habit, you need to replace it with a new one so that you won't want to go back to the old habit, right? And Galatians 5, 16 says it really clearly. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, church, if we do all our relational prayers, like what Pastor showed and what I showed earlier there, repentance and all that, and then we go back to the ways of the flesh, what a waste. Right. 
We walk in the Spirit so that we can be led by the Spirit when we pray for souls, when we pray for God's kingdom. Amen? We do that in the Spirit. No other way. You can't fight with your flesh. You can't fight with your flesh. You're going to lose with your flesh. You'll become a casualty with your flesh. So we have to fight in the Spirit. So our relational prayers teach us to stay in the Spirit. Now, what is walking in the spirit? It is abiding in the spirit. It is being in a spirit of prayer at all times. From the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, yes. Yes. That's it. That every day is your spiritual day. I didn't say pray 24-7, but continually, as the Lord leads you to say your prayers, yes, but you're in a spirit of prayer from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Walking in the spirit is being in a spirit of prayer at all times or praying without ceasing when the Lord leads you to. Okay? It is continually abiding in God's peace. Amen? And abiding in God's righteousness. Remember I talked about the counterpart of that? Self-righteousness, right? So when we have God's righteousness on us and we have his peace, we should be keen to discern if self-righteousness is speaking to us, right? Amen. Now let's take a second look at that list of how to win the battles of our flesh. Did you notice that most of these are part of our relational prayer? Amen. So your relational prayer every day is foundational to receiving God's peace and qualifies us to be able to walk in the spirit so that we don't walk in the flesh. Here's a question. Will it always be a perfect battle with our flesh? No. Because some of us are like onions, having to peel off layers of our self-will in order to fully or cons consistently walk in the spirit is asking me a consistent walk. But you will get there as you make up your mind to surrender everything to Jesus. And then after you do that, you'll wonder why you waited for so long to do it. Because it's a much harder battle when you try to control your own life or preserve your own life. Hear me again. It's a much harder battle when you try to control or preserve your life. Amen. Yes. Now let's talk about the third voice or the voice of the enemy. And this is also referred to as our one-on-one -on -one battle with the enemy. If you remember our lesson on the soldier's battle, that's the second battle, which is the foundation of the battles in the Word of God. Okay, our one-on-one, -on -one, this is what we encounter every time, our one-on-one -on -one battles with the enemy. And it's still dealing with the mind, okay? Remember, the adversary's greatest power over us is only words. Only words. Or the thoughts or feelings that he plants in our minds at any time. Any time. God gives him the liberty to do that any time. But it is our response to it, to these thoughts, that can give him more power over us. You see, he plants the seeds in our minds, but if we don't recognize it, we cultivate it by our speech and our actions. That's how it works, and that's why we need to be able to to discern his voice because more than the flesh, his voice is very destructive. Now, the second and third voices may sound alike. Why? Because they both cater to the drives of our flesh. Remember, the enemy has all the time to study us and he has learned the weakness of your flesh and that's what he uses to entice us. And then on top of that, the enemy can very, be very subtle 
in his deception so subtle that his thoughts may sound like your very own thoughts because he has learned the language of your flesh. A lot of revelation today, man. Makes us less ignorant, right? Knowledge is power. We're response, more responsible now, and we know how to deal with this. You won't feel God's peace when the enemy speaks, but because he's very subtle, okay, and he's wise, the devil's not going to make it obvious for you, but he'll make it sound, the thoughts that come in your mind, he'll make it sound so logical to your own personal reasoning. And along with that, you'll feel a subtle pressure to act upon the thought because it appeals to the satisfaction of your flesh or your ego. Remember that self-righteousness? Oh, I gotta say it. I gotta do it. It's the right thing. Huh, that's how the flesh and the enemy, similar, right? Now let me give you an illustration so we'll learn how to evaluate this. Let's say you start your day with prayer and you do your relational prayer first, then you feel the peace of God, which we should, right? We, we, we do our relational prayer, we repent, we cast our cares, we submit everything to God until we feel the peace, okay? So you feel the peace of God and then you wear the armor of God to cover you. Afterwards, you engage in kingdom prayer for, for a while until you feel a release and God's peace confirms that. Amen? Whenever we do our kingdom prayer, let, let there be a release before we stop. Let them, let's feel or feel the peace of God for us to stop that prayer time. And then you start going about your day doing other things, but still abiding in his spirit. Yes. And then all of a sudden, a thought or feeling comes into your mind or spirit, which affects your peace. Perhaps it's a feeling of fear right, right. or anxiety. And perhaps a thought in your mind that goes like this. Huh. You know, so many people, this is going in your head, so many people are getting the coronavirus. And I can't take a risk with my health even if I'm not that old. You know, I, I might need to stop attending church on Sunday so that I can be really careful. Does that thought sound familiar? Now let's analyze this illustration. What should we do with that particular thought? I know I said it audibly, but imagine that it's just a thought, okay? What do we do with that particular thought or voice? First, is that we need to know what? Oh, did I skip that one? We need to know the thoughts, the source. I'm sorry. Did I miss something here? Okay. I'm just going to go with my notes. We need to know the source of that voice. Is it God's voice? Or is it the voice of my flesh or human will? Or is it the enemy's voice? We need to know the source. There, that's the right slide. Which voice? Which voice is it, okay? If you've learned how to walk in God's peace continually, more than likely you will feel a check in your spirit that tells you that may not be God's voice, okay? Because you don't feel the peace, right? That's a check, okay? And then you can continue to check it out. Remember, keep your mouth your mouth shut, you're not acting on it, you're not speaking it out, the thought, okay? Okay? So, you likely, you feel a check, okay, and then you continue to check it out according to what? God's word, right? We measure it with God's word, the thought. So let's do that. Oh, okay. In the word of God, uh, are, are your verses you can think of? Well, one verse says that God has not given us what? A spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Okay, that's a good one. 
So if we choose not to go to church because of fear, then whose voice are we following? Not God's. All right, not God. Okay. Another voice says, I believe this is in Hebrews 10, 25. It says, forsake not what? The assembling of ourselves together. And it says, especially now that the coming of the Lord is approaching. Are we living in the last days? Yes. I think we are, right? <laughs> and so, wow. Okay, that's another good scripture, right? Do not forsake the coming to the church, okay? Then the Bible also teaches us that we must submit to our spiritual authorities and, the, and that God promises what? His protection over us when we do that. So if my pastor says it's fine, then it must be fine. So back to that illustration, was that a voice from God that... Thank you. My daughter was shaking her head because everybody else was not. Okay. <laughs> Back to the illustration, the thought, oh. the audible thought. <laughs> okay. Of the coronavirus anxiety fear. Okay. All right. No. No, it was not. Okay. All right. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Because my peace did not support it, and especially because it contradicts the word of God. Amen. We got to learn this. So we've eliminated God's voice from the list. And the next step is what? To determine if the source of that voice is from our flesh or from the enemy. In order to determine if it's our flesh or human will, we need to check ourselves. Say that. Check yourself. Okay? And these are the same steps that we do in our relational prayer. I hope by now you've memorized that. Amen? Let's call it our self-check. All right. So for, this is our self-check. Okay, let me click the button for the self-check. All right. It's not clicking for me. Okay. Self-check. This is our self-check. All right, I will speak it out. First question, because you're familiar with this. First question is, is there any sin that I have not repented of? Okay, you know that, right? Number two, second is, are there any grudges that I have not forgiven? Sounds familiar, right? Thank you. All right. Um, third is, have I cast all my cares on the Lord and let go of control of everything? Okay, remember, cares and control, release of that. And fourth question you should ask is, have I surrendered and submitted all of my will to God today? After all these questions are addre addressed, and then you, you've done it, let's say you said, okay, I, I, I don't have any re repentance in it and everything, you answer that correctly, and if you still do not have peace, then it is an attack from the enemy, that voice. That is an attack from the enemy after you've checked yourself, okay? It's always best to check yourself to make sure to determine if it, is it you're just your flesh talking or is it the enemy. If you've done all that, you've repented, you've cast your cares. If you did it like another time after you've done it and then still no peace, then that is an attack from the enemy. Okay? So what do I need to do? The voice or this, this spirit of the enemy needs to be confronted and defeated through prayer. And do you remember our lesson last Wednesday? What are our two primary offensive weapons against the enemy? Sword of the Spirit. Thank you, Brother Paul. Sword of the Spirit. And what's the other one? Okay, Rhema is the same as Sword of the Spirit. It's praying in the Spirit, okay? Okay, so let's go next slide. Using the Sword of the Spirit or the Rhema. The rain is a spoken word. That is your sword. Amen? And you, when you release that, you're binding or you're loosing. That's the way you're releasing. When you bind or loose things, that's the rain. But God's giving you the rain. And also, our other weapon is praying in the spirit, specifically war their tongues. Okay? When we battle with the attack of the enemy. All right. So you, you, you do this until you, we use the sword of the spirit, which is the same as binding and loosing with the raiment, and we pray in the spirit, specifically warfare tongues, until you feel the spiritual release or God's 
peace. So this is how we conduct our one-on-one -on -one battle with the enemy. The spirit is a common attack of the enemy, but we will deal with many other types of spirits in these battles. Hopefully, maybe next time I can give you more examples of these. But at any time that you sense a lack of peace, remember, that's the signal for you to discern the voice or spirit behind it. And usually a planned attack from the enemy will not happen when you're having a powerful prayer meeting. With regards to our 24-hour prayer chain, since we are on the offense, it's not a surprise for us when the enemy fights back, and for the most part, we're ready for it. I hope we're ready for it, right? Amen. So a planned attack from the enemy will usually happen when you least expect it. Or when your spiritual tank is low, or when your physical and emotional tank is lower, all of that, okay? For the enemy is wise and is cunning. In conclusion, God allows us to face and fight these internal battles or the battles of our mind so that we can gain experience and sensitivity to those battles outside of us that need to be fought in the future. For now, there will be many battles and many wars to fight, but in the end, victory, amen? amen. Victory is promised to the church of God. Amen. Let's take the time and just thank God and worship Him. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your promise, oh God. Thank you for the revelation of your word, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. If you're at home, would you indulge me and stand in the name of Jesus Christ? Let's practice what we learned this evening. Amen. You have to hide the word of God in your heart. So you could use the word of God as the sword of the spirit. That's why it's important to read, to memorize the word. And at the right time, in Jesus' name, God's going to give you the memory to quote the word as a sword in battle. And you can pray in tongues, which is praying in the spirit. As the apostle Paul said, right now, would you just close your eyes and would you begin to fight in Jesus' name, whatever you're going through. You fight for your families in the name of Jesus Christ. Fight for your soul in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're condemned because you made mistakes, you cannot undo those mistakes, but you do not have to be condemned. You can quote the word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For you're not walking after the flesh, but after the spirit. I bind that condemnation out of the mind in the name of Jesus Christ. And I lose hope and I lose peace. Lord, I lose your blood that covers a multitude of sins, a multitude of mistakes. And I lose hope for more. I lose joy. I lose joy and peace upon you. Jesus in your name, go ahead, pray in tongues somebody, pray in tongues in the name of Jesus Christ, you have audience with the Almighty, the angels of the Lord that are your disposal, and it's at your disposal right now that angel that you showed up, Go ahead, talk in tongues. Go ahead, talk in tongues. Yea, I'm no ragataya da sate. Those you that are hearing this on recording, talk in tongues. Yo, ragata is a shanda kata. Me, yea, ne go for it. 
So linger for just a moment. Your lingering in the presence of God is going to allow you to receive things from Him. His creative work is being planted. It's being sown inside your very soul, inside your very being. Let people say that once you leave this place, that they're going to see a change. That the people you come in contact with, they're not even going to recognize you. Let people say For those of you that are watching at home right now, what's happening in this place, it can happen in your room right now. The delivering power that you feel, it's going to deliver the atmosphere that you're dwelling in right now. It's in your building, it's in wherever you are. That the atmosphere, oh Lord, that's in this place, oh Lord, that your presence and that your power would transmit to the airways, oh Lord, to the room, to the very place, to the very bedroom, oh God, wherever they're watching, the atmosphere, I lose it because Yoka 
Linger forever how long God tells you to. Because there are some things that you're going to catch in this atmosphere. Only if you linger. Only if you dwell. Only if you stay in this place. Where God begins to work on you and transform you. There's someone in this building right now that God is going to do something special with. God is going to do something mighty with you. But I'm telling you right now, and I want you to listen. You know who you are. It's going to require you to surrender everything. It's going to require you to surrender. It's going to require you to surrender your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations. And you want God to work on you. And you want God to transform you. That before you decide to do what you want to do with your life, that God is letting you know right now, I have a plan for you. My intention and my desire is to do something creative inside of you. But it's going to require you to give up what you want to do. It's going to require you to relinquish your dreams and your hopes for the calling, for the higher purpose. God has an intention towards you. God has a desire towards you. His desire is to work on your life. His desire is to do a creative work. Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Gloria, talamayanda, rakatalamayanda, kasatalaya.